Hey everybody, Dwayne Laughlin here in our Grand Magic Theater in Colon, Michigan, all by myself in front of the video camera to talk to you for a while. A couple weeks back, I filmed a lecture on how to structure a show and I posted it on Facebook. I was worried that that lecture might be a little bit long for people to actually watch on Facebook, but uh, many of you sat and watched it all the way through. I received some good comments, some good feedback. And that motivated me to go ahead and do this second presentation, which is a follow-up. My goal with this second presentation was to keep it shorter than the first one, but I don't think I did that. <laughs> uh, there's so much to say on this matter. So um, I really do appreciate those of you who take the time to watch this all the way through. And I encourage you, if you've just started watching this, to listen to it a little bit to see what you think. Uh, if you don't have time to watch it all the way through, now just set aside some time and treat it like attending a lecture. This is free, so it's, you know, it's a great opportunity for you, but set aside some time to just sit and watch this from start to finish because I think you'll find it to be uh, very helpful. It has to do with how to put music into a show. And this is something I've been asked about many times over the years and I've discovered that many struggle with the matter. So I decided to try to uh, put together the, the heart of what I believe relating to music and its use in a show. And as I prepared this, as I researched it, I came up with all kinds of things I want to say. And, and I have extensive notes, and I know that and usually they say the best speaking is when you do it without notes. But uh, I have a busy life and a lot of things going on, and there wasn't time to try to get all this in my head as clearly as I wanted, so I am going to rely heavily on my notes as we go, and I trust you'll understand that, and it will not be a problem. So let's just get this started. Music, the magician's magical tool. Have you ever stopped to consider the fact that even the old silent movies were not silent? In fact, it's kind of strange that they were called silent movies. They were silent movies because they didn't have an audio track built into the film, but they weren't silent when they were film presented. When they were put up on the screen, there was music. Listen to an article. This was in the New York Times. The title of the article was Silent Films Had a Musical Voice. And the Basic theme of the article, you might say the opening line of it was, and this is a quote, in the 1920s, the old Capitol Theater in New York had a staff of a half dozen working under a music director to prepare a score for each film. Now he's talking about silent movies, and he was saying they actually had a musical director there that prepared a score uh, for every silent movie. And then it goes on to say, full orchestras were as common in the greatest movie palaces as in opera houses. So in those days, silent movie houses had orchestras just like operas did. Well, we know operas need musical uh, background. We, they need musical instruments. I mean, singing and instruments go together. But we maybe haven't thought about how uh, movies and orchestras went together back then. I mean, in those days, music wasn't recorded. They didn't have records and things like that. So live music accompanied the film. On the high-level places, they had these big orchestras that would play in the background in the film. Uh, if it was a place that couldn't afford a full orchestra, a lot of theater houses across the country built in these big pipe organs. And as you think about it, you probably recollect, you've heard about these pipe organs, and maybe you've even been somewhere where they still have the pipes on the wall. Well, somebody would play this pipe organ to accompany the silent movies. And if they didn't have a pipe organ, they would at least have an old piano. The necessity of putting music to a movie was clearly understood from the very beginning. And this is a truth yet understood today. A famous film director from our generation, Martin Scorsese, speaking of our time now in history, says, music and film are inseparable. Then the famous film director and producer Steven Spielberg, he says, and this is a very interesting quote, he says, I believe the marriage of film and music is one of the most gloriously natural and cosmically intended unions in the human experience. Well, we're not filmmakers, we're magicians. But I believe that for magicians, music is just as important to a magic show as music is to a movie. For as with a movie, so with a magic show, music allows people to not only think about what they see, or not only to see, but to feel what they see. 
Music allows that to happen with the music. It, it, it gives emotion to the situation. And so with a magic show, it presents emotion. It presents a mood. Music brings in a feeling. And I'll just go ahead and demonstrate this for you. Uh, here's a trick where I don't talk. Let me see, see if I... That's not the music. <laughs> well, this is live and I'm here. I was just filming a... Uh, let me back this up. I was just filming something to help out one of the young people on our show. I was giving him a, a background for a, a multiplying milk bottle trick. And uh, clearly, I did not uh, get the right music up. So here we go. So anyway, so now I'm going to uh, do a magic trick for you. I'm not going to say a word. And the point is, the music gives, a, it gives the trick a voice. Uh, the music conveys a mood, it creates a feeling, uh, it makes the trick be what I want it to be. So, here we go. I hope. That's it. Okay, I'll push pause and get this out of the way. I'm not going to talk about how that particular trick is done. Obviously, that's just a, a matter of color changing plumes. But here's the point. Um, the question is, what was the feeling for that routine? It was one of pleasantness, right? It was a lighthearted, just sort of a happy bit of magic. Maybe you could say happiness with a little bit of whimsy thrown in. Well, what was the thing that made it so clear? that that was the mood or the feeling for the routine, that it was a happy routine with a little bit of whimsy. It was the music. The music instantly and automatically establishes a happy, whimsy feeling. Film director and uh, film producer George Lucas of Star Wars movies fame, you certainly have heard of the Star Wars movies. Listen to this. This one really surprised me. He said the sound in music is 50% of the entertainment in a movie. 50%. That's an amazing statement. In other words, Lucas was saying, in his opinion, what people hear in a movie is equal in importance to what they see. Now, that's quite a point to ponder, isn't it? <laughs> well, I believe this, again, applies to a magic show. What people hear is just as important as what they see. And I wonder if we as magicians have really thought this matter through as we should, if we've really given it the, the, the credence that we should. What they hear is as important as what they see. Before television existed, before movies existed, before any kind of modern media existed, the gifted storyteller Hans Christian Andersen made this statement. He said, where words fail, music speaks. Now, I found that to be extremely interesting because this man lived before there was television, before there was radio, before there was iPods, before there were MP3 players, before there were cell phones. I mean, this was back when all they had was books and paintings and, of course, live music played by way of instruments. Even so, Hans Christian Andersen was saying that music speaks. When words fail, music speaks. Music's an incredibly powerful tool. A powerful tool. Maybe, it may be the most powerful tool there is for impacting human emotion. That's another thing to think through. It's been said that, that music is the language of emotion. 
on its own with no help from words or pictures, music can suggest beauty, happiness, sadness, danger, peace, mystery, adventure, love, and even worship. Music's an amazing thing. So those of us who specialize in the art of amazement are foolishness. Foolish. <laughs> trying to read my notes. I got messed up. We are foolish. Oh my, the lights are changing on me. Those of you who saw my last video, remember I filmed these in a place where the lights are on a motion timer. I was going to take them off the motion timer before I started this video, and I forgot. So anyway, ignore the fact that the lights change as I talk, but here's what I'm trying to say. And that is, those who specialize in the art of amazement are foolish if we don't see music as one of the most important tools in our magical toolbox. And that brings us to what this presentation is really about, which you're probably hoping I'll finally get around to, to talking about. And that is, well, then how then do we properly put music into a magic show? And I've got some good news for you, and that is it's not a hard thing to do. It's a simple thing that we are going to talk about now from just two directions. First of all, I'm going to discuss how to choose music. And then second, I'm going to discuss how to use music. So we start with how to choose music, and I will immediately give you the answer. Are you ready? How do you choose music for a magic show? Do it like Hollywood does. The answer is no more complicated than that. You say, well, what do you mean, like how Hollywood does? Well, the most obvious role music plays in the movies is that of signaling to an audience how they should feel about what they're seeing, right? It happens in a movie, and some of the quotes I've already made emphasize this. Mu the music signals to an audience how they should feel about what they're seeing, and that's what we do with, in a magic show. We use music to signal to an audience how they should feel about what they see. The uh, science writer Philip Ball, author of a little thing called The Music Instinct, speaking of how music is used to communicate, said, our response to certain kinds of music is something so profound in us, we cannot switch it off. Film composers know that and use it to shortcut the logical part of our brain and get straight to our emotional centers. That's almost scary. <laughs> he's, what he's saying is, a, a, a great a film producer, uh, somebody's producing a film, can use music to shortcut the logical part of our brain and get straight to the emotional center. In other words, it doesn't have to be explained to it, explained to us because music makes it feel it right away. And what he's talking about is how music evokes different kinds of feelings. And he's saying this is something so strong in us as human beings that it overrides logic. You can get people to feel something and they don't even hardly need to think about it. You can just get them to feel it if you play the right music. Music is a quick convincer. Therefore, and this is going to be practical, hang with me. You know, I, think, I love to think this stuff through, but I'm going to tell you exactly what to do specifically for your show. But what I'm saying is when we plan our shows and we think about the kind of music we want to use, we ask ourselves the question, how do I want people to feel about this routine? How do I want them to feel about this trick? Then the song that I choose is one that has to, to complement or, or, shall we say, evoke those feelings. In other words, do I want to have the audience, to, uh, the audience to have a sense of excitement? Well, then I play exciting music. That's not hard to figure out. Do I want them to have a sense of, uh, let's say, love and appreciation? then I'm going to pick some sentimental music. Do I want them to have a sense of anticipation and suspense? Then I'm going to pick some dramatic music. And it really is that simple. We connect the mood of the music to the mood that we want with a trick and routine. Now, I know so, for some performers, this idea of thinking about the mood of your tricks and novel thought. I mean, you're still in, on the level of you just do tricks and think, well, I'm, I'm supposed to fool people and that's it. And if that's where you're thinking, you really don't understand yet what entertainment's about and communication is about. Because if you're entertaining, if you're communicating, then you're concerned about how people are responding. You're, re you're concerned about what the audience is experiencing. It's not just am I fooling them, but what do they experience? And as soon as you care about their experience, then you understand there is a mood that does need to be attached to this thing that, that I'm doing. And let me go a little farther on this. As obvious as this concept is, and that is the mood of the song should match the mood of the routine, there are performers, especially those who are new and un uninformed, who struggle with this. And I know some experienced performers who struggle with this too. 
and they struggle because they think the important thing about music is that songs be current or popular. They want to take something that right now is number one on the charts and they want to put that straight into their show and their thinking is, well, if I choose a song that, that everyone likes right now and that everyone thinks is cool, well, then if I put it into my show, they're going to think it's cool that it's in the show and who knows, they might even end up thinking that I'm cool. You know, so I, I need to use cool songs, modern songs, hip songs to convey to everybody that I'm a cool, hip, modern person. And so their opinion is, if a song's popular and currently on the charts, that ought to be great in a show. And I say, no, 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 that's not the way to think. Now listen, no matter how popular a song might be, if on the level of emotion and feeling it does not properly correspond to the illusion being presented, it's not going to work. The issue is not, is the song popular or unpopular? Is the song new or old? Is the song well-known or hardly known? The issue is, does the song tell the story I'm trying to tell with my magic? It has to tell the same story I want my trick to tell. Now, a great example of this is the example Lance Burton took to FISM back in 1982. FISM, of course, is the, the Olympics of magic. And Lance won a FISM in stage contest, which is something that Americans have forever struggled to do. Uh, so this was back in the 1980s, and when Lance Burton won FISM, he was 22 years old. So, did he perform to the kind of music that was popular to 22-year-olds at that time in the 1980s? Did he perform to a song that was number one on the charts back then, and that's why his act did so well? No. He performed to Antonio Vivaldi's Four Seasons, which was composed in the year 1723. It was classical music. He was a young man. He was using music that was pretty much 300 years behind him in time, and yet it corresponded perfectly with the classy and classic style he'd perform, chosen for himself. So he's got this music that's 300 years old, he's 22 years old, but his style's classic, his style is classy, the music is classic, the music is classy, and it worked perfectly and it resulted in an award-winning act. Well, I'll admit, and I, I think you can tell that I get worked up on this, but I really do get peeved when people try to suggest that the best music for a show must be something that's popular at the moment. And it also peeves me when people suggest that as a performer ages, he should keep changing his music to keep up with the times. No, no. Now, there's truth in that suggestion. If the performer, uh, in the first place, chose his music, with the goal of trying to seem like he was current and tuned into the times. In other words, if, if your goal from the beginning is to have this current, edgy music that fits what's going on in culture right now, well then obviously uh, you have to keep changing your music because culture keeps changing and you've got to keep, try to keep up with the constantly changing uh, whims uh, of the human race. So if, if the goal from the beginning is to be current, well then obviously you've got to keep your music current. But on the other hand, if the goal is to find a song that matches the mood and feeling of what you're presenting, if it's a good match, it'll continue to be a good match. Over the course of time, it really won't matter how well the song is known or not known. If the mood works, it works. In fact, you might be able to take an obscure song and turn it into a signature piece. And the point I'm making here, and I know I'm sort of preaching at you, and by the way, I'm going to show you more tricks, so hang in there. But anyway, the point is, when you're putting music into a show, it's about the emotion, it's about the feeling the song creates. It's not about how popular the song is, it's not about who's known for singing it. It's the emotion, it's the feeling, those are the primary aspects uh, in our consideration. Uh, those are the primary things that guide our choices in a song. So... We're going to get really practical. I told you we would. The terms used to categorize Hollywood movies can be used by magicians as we look for songs to put in a show. So what kind of movies are there? Well, one of the basic lists of film genres is this. Action, comedy. Now, again, we've got different kinds of movies. You've got action movies. You've got comedy movies. You've got dramatic movies. Fantasy, horror, mystery. Romance, thriller, documentary. 
I'm sure there are other words that could also be used and other ways to state the matter, but, but that is a general, uh, there is general agreement that those are standard movie categories. Well, those same categories can be used as categories for music and categories for magic tricks. At the start of the show, I want to generate excitement, so I want the magic to have this feeling of action-adventure. Uh, later in the show, I want times of com comedy. I might want times of fantasy. I might want times of romance. Toward the end of a show, I want a time when the situation is dramatic. There may be a part in the show where I'm explaining something. I'm sort of in the documentary mode. So what we're saying here is there can be a marriage of magic and music as it relates to each category. And I'm just going to go ahead and give you an example of this. And by the way, if you hear noise in the background, Mary's working in another part of the theater, and my dog Bosco's running around back and forth, so just ignore the little noises. I'm going to keep talking. But I'll give you an example. Let's say that um, I've been asked to speak at a banquet. It's like a Valentine's banquet, so a lot of couples there. And I want to do something in the banquet that has to do with romance, has to do with the idea of love. So that means, just like there are romance movies, now I need a romance magic trick. And if it's going to be a romance magic trick, I want, I want some music that provides a little romance to go with it. And uh, this is, you'll see why I'm snickering. Uh, it's kind of a goofy trick. But anyway, here we go. Let me tune up the music. And uh, so I bring a, uh, somebody on stage. And I say, thank you for joining me here on stage. I'm here to talk to you about love. That's right, here to talk to you about love. Yep, it's, this, is, this is a rabbit love story. You see, two rabbits fell in love. There was a boy rabbit, a girl rabbit, they met. He said, would you marry me? She said, yes. He gave her a three carat ring. She ate two of them, but that's another story. It was a beautiful wedding. You should, should have seen her walk down the aisle. She had a gorgeous dress. She could afford it. She was a millionaire. <laughs> oh my, but anyway. Uh, once the wedding was over, reality set in, and these two realized they needed a place to live, and he needed a job. He got an ID, said, I know where I can work. I can work at a hospital. So he went to the hospital to get a job, and they said, sure, you can do it. You can perform operations. But he had to leave her behind and was concerned to keep her safe. So normally, this would go into a spectator's hand. Your job's to keep her safe while he does his job at the hospital. Now we talk about the power of love. You see, as he was working, he thought about her constantly. And the moment work was over, he arrived by her side quick like a bunny. You won't believe how quick it happened. In fact, look. And the first spectator opens up her hand, and look at that. He's back by her side. Let's hear it for the power of love. But I know what some of you are thinking. Did they live happily ever after? How did the rest of their story go? Well, I'm happy to tell you it went pretty well, but sometimes it was a rather hair-raising experience. See what I mean? All these little bunnies. So all the little bunnies appear in the spectator's hand. And I say, folks, there's a moral to the story. And the moral is, you're no bunny until somebody loves you. <laughs> a silly play on words, but a reminder of the importance and the power of love. And give my volunteer, uh, my invisible volunteer today, a big round of applause. There's a big round of applause as she takes her seat. And that is the end of the story. Ah, okay, and I'll let the music end. Well, a little weird to do that with all of, out of volunteer. That is a, a routine that I call, what do I call that? I put it on the market so long ago, I can't remember. Um, oh, we've got a name. Anyway, it's my version of the giant uh, sponge rabbits. What do we, Mary, are you, can you hear me? Oh, uh, thank you. Mary's in the background. It's a, we call it a hair-raising experience. I knew there was a good name for that. But anyway, it's just a giant version of the sponge rabbits. It's a silly trick. Uh, in some ways, it may seem ridiculous. But if you think back to what you just saw, because of the music, it still had the, that romantic feeling. Because of the music, the trick works, and I can tell you it works. I've done it for audiences many times. Well, it works because the music conveys the mood that I want to go with the trick. So let's get back to these categories of movies and how we use them with magic and music. We start collecting songs that we think we might use in a show, and as we collect the songs, we put them into categories. So you don't just have a list of songs. Instead, you've got 
categories. In other words, a number of lists. You've got a list for action, adventure songs. You've got a list for romance songs. You've got a list for fantasy songs. Maybe a list for scary songs, whatever it might be. So you have all these different categories under which you can list music, and as you l listen to music, you decide what category uh, does that go into. And, and maybe at this point you think, well, I don't know if I'm equipped to do that, so let me take you back to a quotation I used earlier. Uh, that science writer Philip Ball, remember what he said? Our response to certain kinds of noise is something so profound in us, we can't switch it off. What he's saying is for some reason when we hear certain sounds as human beings, we just know what they signal. Nobody has to explain it to us. We just know. Another um, interesting quote, Matthew Skelton, this was on the web website Film Score Monthly. He'd been studying, uh, doing a content analysis, re content analysis relating to music as it's used with films, and he said, film music polarizes the emotional atmosphere and influences the understanding of the plot. That's another really strong word. Music polarizes. What he is saying is music sends a message which people simply can't deny. The music tells them how to feel, and when they hear that music, they have to accept that feeling. Well, I'm going to give you some musical examples. I want us to understand how this easy this is, so I'm going to play some songs now. Got my iPod all set up. And I suspect you will automatically know this, the mood that they suggest. Now these are royalty-free songs, which means you would not have heard them before. You will not be associating them with any book, with any story. So it's doubtful, unless you've got the same royalty-free music I do, it's doubtful you'll have any previous experience with these songs. And yet the moment I start playing them, if you had those categories, action, adventure, suspense, whatever it is, you would know what category the song would go into. Uh, let's see where we start here. What do I have first? And go. What do you say? Action, adventure? Can you imagine a spy movie, something like that? I mean, you just automatically know that's, that's what the music is. Uh, here's the music I just played for the rabbits. Oh, no, it's not. This is a different one. What comes to your mind? A circus. How could it not come to your mind? If not a circus, you're thinking of you know, a big happy time, a fair. Maybe you can imagine lots of people, lots of color, lots of fun things going on. Let's try this one. Now this might be harder to put into a category. You might call this um, a drama. Maybe uh, you would put this into something kind of thought-provoking, maybe reminiscing. But whatever word you use for it, you know the feeling. I think I skipped a song. Let's see where I am here. Fantasy? Fairy tale? I use this particular music for my floating tale, or floating table. I talk about, you know, this the story of this man who made a table float and as I'm telling the story, sort of a fantasy story, fantasy music plays in the background. Let's see what else I have for you here. Are you thinking detective? Let's go on a search. Let's look for the clues. Maybe you could imagine this playing behind a mind reading routine where you're trying to figure out what people are thinking. Um, here's one where you might want to take people back in time, get them thinking about their childhood, maybe a decision they made in past life, something or in the past in their life, something like that. I think you understand where I'm going with this. There's an automatic mood that comes in with the music. This is going to make you think of comedy, right? Clowning around. That sort of thing. Well, we could go on. And, um, well, I'll play one more. This, uh, in fact, here's it. 
What I wanted to mention is that not only does it convey mood, but it also can convey culture and even time. For example, this music may, think you, may make you think back to the, the, the Roaring Twenties, or at least early days, earlier days in American history. Tell me what this music makes you think of. give you a clue we have that this that, that music in our show this year and it's used with a rope trick and we call it the Spanish rope trick the music has a sound it makes you think of of a you know a, a Spanish or at least a a Mexican kind of a situation how about this I mean, it's obvious right oriental maybe Japan maybe China but the music right away sends out a message and sort of puts a person into a place. Um, here's another example of time. Let's go back to the 1950s. Okay, that's enough of that, but I, but I trust I've made the point, and that is that uh, what I'm trying to do is encourage you, you don't have to be a musical genius to figure out what category a song goes into. You listen to the song, and you're the performer, what matters is you, and you say, for me, this is an action song. You don't have to have anybody else verify your choice. You just say, this is how it feels to me. And so now you start, here, here's songs that I put under the action. Here's songs I put under suspense. Here's songs I put under drama. Here's songs I put under romance. Here's songs I put under comedy, and so on. Now, uh, I will tell you that I'm suggesting you use the Hollywood categories, but I also want to suggest that you make some categories of your own and modify the categories. For example, I do a lot of gospel magic, a lot of public speaking. So I have a category that I call heart to heart. And this is music I want to use when I'm speaking to people very directly about choices they need to make and about aspects of their life. I also have a category for music called introspection. And uh, this is when I want people to sort of look inside themselves and think about who they are. And these are songs that I might play like an invitation in a church, or let's say I'm speaking in a school program, and I want people to really think seriously about who they are. I'll give you an example of this. This is directly from a school show. I have a question for you. Who is somebody special? Most of us would be likely to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm normal. No, I'm, I'm not the tallest, I'm not the shortest, I'm not the fastest, I'm not the slowest, I'm not the smartest, I'm not the stupidest, I'm just, I'm normal, you know, I'm just a, a regular person. And we feel okay about ourselves, maybe pretty good about ourselves until this guy comes along. <laughs> this person does seem to be superior, I mean, look at that. You don't line up very well against this person. This person is bigger and stronger and faster and smarter and has more money and gets better grades. And all of a sudden, when you line yourself up to this person, you don't feel so good about yourself after all. In fact, you might start feeling a little bit inferior. And then there are some folks that this is their story from the start. They never have felt very good about themselves. They've always struggled with self-esteem. You hear about being a few sandwiches short of a picnic. This guy can't even find the picnic. He says, I've got problems. I'm a loser. Well, if what mattered in life is how we compare to other people, I suppose we'd say maybe somebody is a loser. And somebody's a big winner. That's not the way we're supposed to look at life. No. We're to understand that People see the differences, but God sees us all the same. For example, if I take this one, the normal one here, and I put one end by the other end, when you look, you see that up here, the ends are the same. It's different here, but it's up here. Now, this may not make much sense to you, but hang in there. You'll see what I mean. Even the little guy. We'll put him over here like this. There we are. Up here, it's the same. Even the big guy, if I take one end and I put it up by the other end, it's, it's the same, up here. Down here different, up here the same. And there's a truth here, and by the way, I'm going to pause to say, if I'm doing a gospel show, I talk about how God sees us all the same. If I'm doing a school show, I just talk about how there's an, a way in which everybody's the same. But I'm going to go ahead and, and put the, the lesson I would do for a church here, I guess. So that is, God sees us all the same. The Bible's very clear about it, and that is, number one, God sees us all as sinners. 
There's no such person as someone who hasn't messed up and is that we're all spiritually losers without the grace of God in Jesus Christ and that we're all the same. But God also loves us all the same and, and not only does he love us all the same, but he is a God who has given his son Jesus Christ so that we all can be forgiven and come into his family in the same way. In, all words, in other words, we're all sinners, but we all need a savior and the same savior can save every one of us. So we're all in the same situation, and I've tied the ropes together to illustrate that. We're all in the same situation when it comes to the eyes of God. And what that means then is we all need to do the same thing. And that is give our hearts to Jesus Christ and begin to look at life from God's point of view. Because when we look at God's point of view, we discover we really are all in the same situation. And that is everybody matters, everyone's important. Honoring God with our life is the same thing, same opportunity we all have. We all want to do the best we can to serve God. All of us matter. Well, there's more I could say about that. Again, I, I got a little confused here. I, in my notes, I was going to do my school show version, then I started into my gospel version. But uh, totally aside from the trick, because this is not about tricks, the music. If we back it up, in fact, I'll play a little bit more. This is what I call the, the introspective or the heart-to-heart uh, -heart music. It's the kind of song that, that causes people to think. Think about who they are, think about their lives while the songs are playing. So once we understand the power of music to convey emotion, what we're doing is we're putting music into our shows on the basis of the desired emotion. And to do this, being now practical, we need lists of songs that we've already associated with various categories. Categories of emotion and feeling. And then all we have to do is identify the kind of emotion we want with the trick or routine, and then we find the emotion, and uh, we match it up with the trick, and away we go. For example, something like Hippity Hop Rabbits, you know, you want something fun, you want something lighthearted. But then maybe toward the end of your, your show, instead you want something that's very dramatic. And I think that's enough to say about that. Uh, clearly, uh, you, you just connect the feeling with the song. So let's, let's move into another aspect. And did I skip a point here? Actually, I think I just forgot to tell you when I moved from part one to part two. But what I want to say is, um, as we move toward the end of this, is that some tricks, you know, I talk about you know, looking at a magic trick and what is the mood for the trick. Some tricks can be used to convey a number of different moods, and they can be used in a number of different ways. And there again, the music is what makes that happen. So here's an example for you. The trick I'm going to use is typically, typically called the patriotic ropes. And again, this is not a lecture on how to do tricks. I'm just trying to, to give you examples of how the music makes a difference. But what I'm going to do is do a patriotic version of this, which obviously would want patriotic music. But then I'm going to do a non-patriotic, lighthearted entertainment version of this. And so I'll need entirely different music to create an entirely different mood. And uh, the pattern's going to be a little rough on this because I worked hard to get this <laughs> lecture ready. And uh, I just grabbed tricks off the shelf without taking time to kind of refresh my thinking about them. But anyway, here we go. So, so where, let's see. Back this up. So, I'd like to talk to you about our country, the United States of America. And the fact that united we stand. Now it's been many, many years ago, but I still remember it vividly when that occasion came that we refer to in terms of history now as 911. My wife and I were in an airplane when it happened, when the World Trade Centers were, were attacked by terrorists and they began to burn as the airplanes hit them and they went down. My wife and I had to have our airplane settle down out in the middle of nowhere across the country and figure out how to drive home because no planes were allowed in the air. I remember all of that very well. And it was a time when the enemy, the terrorists, thought that possibly we could make our nation begin to crumble. A time when we might no longer be strong. And I could see why someone might think that way on the outside looking in, because Americans are different. That's why the colors are different. I chose the colors of our flags, red, white, and blue, to remind us people are different. We got Democrats, we got Republicans, we got Independents. We've got people who go to different kinds of churches, some who don't go to any churches at all. We've got people with all kinds of attitudes and all kinds of lifestyles. And of course, in our country, we've got people from different cultural backgrounds. 
but still united we stand. We are built upon some common principles, and that is we believe in freedom and justice for all. We believe in liberty. We believe that all men should be treated equally. And when Americans unite around those concepts, when we determine that in spite of our differences, we are going to hold to these common beliefs, well, what ends up with is instead of becoming untied, we really are united, we stand strong, and we carry on the message of liberty and justice to yet the next generation. Okay, um, that trick was not done anywhere near as well as I would like to have done it patterwise for you because as I say, I, I just picked it up out of the blue and didn't refresh the pattern line. But I think even so, you understand with the patriotic pattern in the background and with the words, it still works. And uh, it, uh, you know, if, if I was doing a show, of course, I would take some time to review it. And I promise you it would be a very strong, inspirational message toward the end of the show about how wonderful it is to live in this country, the USA. For a Fourth of July show, which isn't that far away, something like this is a great message. But let's say instead now you've got this trick and it's just, a, you know, it's a really good trick and you want to do it in your show. So you want to present it just for fun. So now, totally different feeling, and the music makes such a difference. Of course, the patter too, but here we go. So. I heard about a man. They say he did something incredible. <laughs> I find it hard to believe. They say this man had three ropes. One was blue, and one was white, and one was red. They say he tied the white and red ropes together. No one knew why he was doing it, they just say he did it. And then the man tied the white rope also to the blue rope. Now, this is just what people say. I, I can't say that I personally saw this happen, but this is what they say happened. They say the man tied three ropes together, and of course, you wouldn't think that was that big a deal. So you wonder, why is the story even told? Why did they even talk about this man? <laughs> it's because of what happened next. They say that after tying the three ropes together, he wrapped them around his hand, like this. Wrapped them around his hand, pointed with his finger, said a few magic words, but he didn't say them out loud, so nobody knew what they were. But what people did know is after doing that, when he unwound the ropes, no longer were they ropes. No longer was there a red rope, a white rope, and a blue rope. There was only one solid rope that was red, white, and blue. They say that's what the man did. You know what else they say? <laughs> they say that once people saw the red, white, and blue ropes, they clapped their hands and cheered like crazy because they knew that was something really amazing. Now, of course, that's just something people talk about. I don't know if anyone could actually do a trick like that, but if you ever did it, it would look like what I just showed you. Okay, so um, no need to talk any longer. I think I've kind of made the point. So the whole idea is, you know, how do you put music into a show? You don't have to be a genius to do it. It's very easy. In fact, it's crazy I've taken so long in this video to make such a simple point, and that is you just look for how the music feels and or the, the, you think about how you want the audience to feel with the trick or routine you're going to do, then you think about the feeling of the music, and you just match music with a trick on the basis of mood and feeling. Just that simple. Don't worry if the song's popular, don't worry if the song is well-known or unknown, doesn't matter. What matters is that the mood of the music matches the mood of the trick, and if you get the right mood in the music, it speaks so powerfully that your patter actually can be quite simple and maybe, like in some of the examples on this video, <laughs> maybe even less than perfect, but it still works well because the music speaks so well. Okay, well I'm going to wrap this up. One last trick for you. See if I can find everything I need for it here. This is not my usual magic table, it's just the one we use for video. But I think I can set things so this will work here. Let me figure this out real quick. Okay. So I'm going to wrap this up with um, a routine I use for public schools. So this is not a gospel routine, but I'm sure you can see how it easily could be turned into a gospel routine. And the music that I choose for this, um, I have a goal. I'm, I want it to be inspirational. I want it to be thought-provoking, but I want it to be inspirational and really 
what I wanted with this music was to, a challenge for people to follow their dreams, to never give up on themselves. And so the, the challenge for me with the music was to find a song that suggests that same thing. Sort of a follow your dreams, never give up. Believe there's light at the end of the tunnel. Believe that good things can still happen. And so I, as I listen to songs, put them in certain categories. And this particular song was kind of in the, the, the romance category and the inspirational category. And it worked very nicely for the routine. So we'll just give you the example. And with that, I'm going to finish. This routine is called Potential. And I'm not sure I started the music right. So let me restart it here. There we go. A magic word for you. Potential. Not abracadabra, not presto. Potential. I believe potential is a magic word because potential is about something you can't see. But it's there. That's what potential is. For example, right now I'm showing you a, a piece of you know, like poster board, thick paper, call it whatever you want to. It's been rolled up. So you see the inside, you see the outside. And you might say, I don't think there's much potential for that. It's just a piece of paper. And there are many people who pretty much feel that way about their lives. They look in the mirror in the morning and they say, I don't know if I really like what I see. And they consider their life experiences so far and they say, I, I don't know that I'm ever going to amount to much. We can't think that way. Because this word potential applies to every one of us. When you look in the mirror in the morning, say to yourself, it doesn't really matter what I see. What matters is what I don't see, and that's potential. I have potential. Everybody has potential. Potential means that there's more than can be accomplished than we might ever think. And we're not going to know what we can accomplish. We're not going to know what we can achieve in life until we go out there and try, and we give it our best, and we refuse to give up. For example, who would have thought that these would be in this paper too? Who would have thought that with a simple little piece of paper, an illusionist, that's me, could do something as interesting as I'm doing right now? But it's happening. There's more to the situation than there would seem to be. And so it is with life. So it is for all of us. What we see on the outside isn't the issue. It's that heart and that determination to follow our dreams and never give up. And I know sometimes we run into situations where people discourage us and make us think we're losers. They say, oh, you'll never amount to anything. There's no hope for you. But don't listen to those people. Understand that maybe they've had some bad experiences and maybe they're just reflecting onto you the fact that they gave up too soon. But you'd be one of those people who says, I'm not going to give up. One of the things I'm absolutely going to make sure that I do in my life is I discover my potential. I never give up on myself. I never give up on my dreams. And maybe someday, just like that caterpillar turns into a butterfly, <laughs> the beauty, the beautiful things that we can accomplish in life will be materialized. We will realize that there was potential. We did have opportunity. We'll be able to say, I gave it my best. I did what I could with what I have, and it turned out there was a whole lot more good things going on in my life than I ever would have dreamed. And that's basically where I finish for a school presentation, and again, the, the patter is sharper. I put more thought into exactly what I'm going to say. But the silk fountain and the mastle tube and the production of silks is very simple. With that music you hear in the background, I'll let it finish out. It really does convey that challenge of follow your dreams, don't give up on yourself. There's hope out there. And then, of course, when we put it in the Christian context, with God, all things are possible. And uh, God is not going to give up on us, so let's not give up on the life and ministry that he's given to us. So um, I, think, I think that's as far as I'm going to go with this. Um, I really wanted to talk about putting music into a show. I wanted to do this lecture for you. But this is an incredibly busy week for us. We're getting ready for our new shows to open. I've got a music practice coming up about the time I put all this stuff away. So um, this maybe wasn't as polished as some of my things, but I think the content's good. I think there's lots to think about. I hope it's helpful. So thanks for taking time to watch. So all I'm going to say about this. This is Dwayne Laughlin. I've been talking to you about how to put the magic of music into your show.